You're listening to WLPNLP Chicago, 105.5 FM, Lumpen Radio, Bridgeport. I knew it. Oh, I knew it. It's September 28, 2017. You're listening to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Better luck next time, John. Hello and welcome to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn, coming to you as always from Studio B here in beautiful Bridgeport, Chicago. Thanks as always to Lumpin' Radio and its fearless leaders, I think, at, at this point. But but the primary fearless leader is Logan Bay. So that's who my, uh, my first thanks go out to. And then all the other fearless leaders who shall remain nameless until they can start the show cleanly, frankly. Um, then, then they'll be named maybe as fearless leaders officially. But I want to thank everybody who is out there listening on 105.5 FM, Lumpin' Radio, or via the uh, Lumpin' Radio app, which you can get on TuneIn Radio or the, uh, well, you can listen to the radio station on TuneIn Radio, but you can download the app and, and listen live. And if you are listening live, you should be in the chat room, which is uh, located at tlk.io slash WLPN. That's tlk.io slash WLPN. And, and you were saying that there were some people complaining, surprise, surprise, last week in the chat room, right, Jack? A couple of yep. complaints mm-hmm. seem that way. Mm-hmm. I think we'll get to it. Yeah, okay. I think we probably will. Um, And uh, thank you to everyone who is listening live. For those of you who are listening via podcast or download or stream or something like that, thank you as well. We we like to thank all our listeners, no matter how they are are participating. Um, And for those of you who are listening for the first time or maybe dropped out and are are tuning back in and, and kind of forgotten what's going on, this used to be such a... Maybe in their mind, some, somehow it got transferred and it was a, a really smooth running show. And, and what is this show? This can't be the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. It never started out that way. If Jack was talking, his mic would have been turned on. But <laughs> things have changed. So let me rehash what, what the goal of the show is. And it's to open up a window into how the people making, selling, marketing, and facilitating the beer, getting into your glass, feel about the topics that are a part of their everyday lives. Many of my greatest beer experiences have been talking about beer while sharing beer with people whose opinions I respect and admire. And it's these experiences I hope to capture with this show, the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. And before I introduce my guests, I I do like to mention that everyone's opinions are their own and are certainly not associated with any other entity such as, for example, Lumpen Radio or the Beer Temple. Um... Just their own. And I, I have to ask Jack, again, not to uh, put you on the spot too many times, as far as this disclaimer goes, I mean, how how do you think that would hold up legally? I mean, you are you I'm are not going to give an opinion on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. Not what I was looking for. <laughs> Thanks. You wouldn't give me your own personal opinion. Even I, would after gi- I would give you my personal so, no, opinion. Well, well, then it just shows how to disclaimer. The disclaimer must be total crap because literally after I said all opinions are their own, you would not give me your own opinion because you didn't believe it was your own well, because you, the you, disclaimer you, was bad. I get it. It could I get, get it. really boring if you wanted to. No, I didn't want to. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's let's get around to it. Let's, uh, let's introduce today's guests. We do it in order of seniority. And I believe Jack, Jack, are you the, the senior? I doubt that. I think you're you're certainly senior in in the room. How many times have you been on on mic? On mic? Yeah. Uh, three, four. I've been in the room. All right, Jack, Jack O'Connor. How are you, man? Good. How what's, are you? What's new with you? 
Uh, summer is finally over. Uh, did a lot of traveling over the summer and, and uh, or late spring. Um, went out to Denver, uh, New England, uh, and then went to Great Taste uh, for the first time this year. Um, so all of that is over. And, and you used to never go to Great Taste because you were always the same weekend as the Festival of Farmhouse Sales. That kind of overstates it, but yeah, I, I hadn't planned on going this year um, because it conflicted, and thankfully, Thank you, uh, they were back-to-back weekends. So I did FOFA uh, one weekend, and then uh, my family and I went up to Madison for the weekend after that, and I ended up going to uh, Great Taste with a friend of mine and had a blast. It was a lot of fun. Right. So you and I have, have talked in the past about you know, what to do that weekend if we're, one were to do one or the other. And I know some people do prefer the uh, festi- Festival of Farmhouse Ales at Hill Farmstead to um, the Great Taste. I've, I've only been to the Great Taste, so I don't know what, which one's better. I They're can very just different. imagine. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine one being better than. So show, show of hands here. Who's been to the Great Taste? Adi. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know. But uh, so so they're very different. Do you? I mean, I guess there is no favorite. There's just uh, – we're, we're getting thumbs I, they're, up here. They're just very different, I would say. Great Taste was, you know, it's hundreds of breweries, and, and you pretty much can't go wrong in terms of, you know, you you fall into good options, um, whereas Fofa is sort of a uh, – collection of highly curated uh, yeah, yeah exactly um and oddly it rained a ton this year and so they they started to kind of a lot of the brewers ran out of beer two or three hours into the festival and so there was sort of this line that started just to build just at hill farmstead because by the end of the festival they, they were they were the only ones serving um but you know by the end of the festival i was plenty <laughs> served so i was i was fine with that cool um yeah just Different vibes, though, for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Next is Mr. Adi Hastings of Omega East Labs. How are you? Good evening. I'm fine. What's What's up with you, Adi? Uh, not much. Uh, uh, also glad the summer is winding down, um, mostly because of the heat. Um, <laughs> like this last week has been Brutal. pretty merciless uh, at my place of work, um, where we have burners going seven days a week. So it's <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Adi works at Omega Yeast Labs. Yes, we make yeast, <laughs> propagate <laughs> it, uh, grow it, sell it. Um, no, but uh, yeah, a few weeks ago, I just got back from. Um, I went up to the Upper Peninsula, which I had never been to before, and then uh, did a circuitous sort of drive around Lake Michigan, um, going back through northern Michigan on the way back. Um, visited a lot of breweries. Um, Any standouts? Um, For one, good or bad? Well, yeah. Do you want to no, trash someone? Uh, no, no. Um, you know, it, it was really interesting. Um, in the in the UP, um, there are a lot of very small breweries that have been around for 10, 15 years and um, doing probably what they were doing since they've been open, um, very small systems and the beer was satisfactory. Um, uh, there were a couple of really nice breweries in, in Marquette, which is the largest city, uh, or uh, had some really very nice beers. Um, black rock also. Um, but then on the way back, I got to visit, uh, uh, speciation and, um, grand rapids. I've never even heard of them. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, um, uh, Mitch Ermentinger is, uh, he used to work at, uh, uh, Black Project, um, oh. and is doing, uh, uh, Brett Saisons and Sours, um, all along the, uh, Rare Barrel model where he contracts wort production out to another brewery and then ferments it, um, in stainless and in barrels, doing some really interesting stuff. Um, so he, hold on, he contracts the wort and then, oh, stainless end in barrels. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, got So, it, got it. Um, yeah, no, and... and um, well, what's the name of that brewery? Uh, Speciation. Speciation, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I got to uh, uh, visit Transient for the first time since he'd opened there. Yes, how was um, your experience there? Oh, it was very nice. I got to chat to it with uh, Chris for a while. and um, I felt very guilty. It had been over a year since he'd opened, and I had not yet made the, what is it, two-hour drive from Chicago right. out there. <laughs> Jack, uh, Andy, and I were just at Kaiser Tiger talking to um, – uh, Pat Berger, who had a uh, somewhat well-known argument on a couple occasions with uh, Chris Betts on this show, uh-huh. and we were uh, and, and Pat had also visited uh, Transient and wanted to go up there, and so it was fun to listen to Pat trash Chris, <laughs> cool. and also get on me for not defending him enough when he was they were arguing on air. So. <laughs> Um, oh, cool! But yeah, no, it was it was a nice like eight day trip, just sort of driving around. Michigan's beautiful. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've 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 witnessed. Um, so, well, thanks for thanks for coming on. You've got your you've got your faux bab shirt, so you're ready to go. Oh, I'm ready to go. I, I'm volunteering again this Uh-oh. year. We got someone disrobing. Oh. My final <laughs> guest, I is the beer scribe. Andy Crouch, beer curmudgeon extraordinaire. He is in studio for the first time live. We're actually talking on the show for the second time because the first time you were on the show was at CBC in Portland, I believe, right? Yeah. CBC Philly. CBC Philly, that's right. And uh, this is your second time. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's good to be here. On the drive over, you were talking about something that I'm sure neither Jack or I were listening to. But it was weird to hear your voice, which I hear only through Skype and the radio, <laughs> right. actually live in the car as you couldn't figure out how to get down to the studio. Right. Uh, and, yeah, it's true. Couldn't c- couldn't figure it out. I come here all the time. You put me on one sep- different road, <laughs> and I need to have... Google Maps. I mean, that's the age we live in where nobody really knows where they are because they're just reliant on technology for everything. Now. I was so. never good at geography to begin with, though. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty good at making my way around, but I just, you get me out of sorts a little bit, and I'm like, ah, I'm just going to, Siri, tell me where to go. I'm, I'm, I'm at your disposal. So you're not wearing a, last time you were on, you had a, a deep V undershirt, you had a, yeah, an undershirt, as, as is your want. That's, Often, that's, what, that's what we do. And you were wearing, uh, you had it classed up. You were wearing a bow tie. I was. I tried to make it nice for this. And so tonight I was appreciating that at least, at least half of the people in the room, you've just let us down, Addy. But like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Jack's deep V is is a thing of beauty. It's great. But it's I decided V-deep. to wear, yours is sort of half, it's, it's fine. It's fine, <laughs> yeah, Chris. Yeah, yeah. But for you guys, I wore the only beer shirt that I own. Oh, is it really? Yeah. And it's, uh, it just says, this is not a hobby. And? It's uh, on the back. Yeah, let me see. Oh, Budweiser. This, <laughs> yeah. this Bud's for you. Yeah. Whoa, that's so I like to wear this old. to craft breweries, and they don't love it, actually. They don't really love <laughs> yeah, it. They think that. it might be a little bit insulting. Right. And uh, But I think it's a, it's a fantastic shirt. So how, how old is that shirt? This shirt is about two or three years old now, and I want Oh, that's it? it? Yeah. Yeah. No, AB's got that money that can make things look older than they actually right. are. Um, but yeah, so I got this at a um, basically a pint night and a dive bar in Boston one night after softball. And it was just a random night and they're handing things out. And I was like, that's what I want. That's like a, a shot shot fired to some craft brewers, mm-hmm. I would say. Oh, it's say. 100%. Yeah, That's man. exactly what they do. Like, you haven't seen a lot of play for this one, but, you know, 100% shots fired. Awesome. Well, this is a brand new undershirt because I wasn't going to bring one of my nasty ones that like comes you know halfway down. Like Ketchup chat. stains? Yeah, you, didn't, you don't want to <laughs> see that. Trust me. Um, but I, I hope you feel honored uh, that two of us, uncoordinated. It is hot in here. <laughs> it is hot in here. So I'm also glad. We might have to open up the doors, but there is a, a show that they're getting set up for out in Studio A. So um, we'll, we'll see. We might just have to grin and bear it. Uh, let's, let's keep going. We got through all the introductions in 14 minutes. This is great. Um, I like that you're impressed about, by that, oh, that, it took, that it only took 14 minutes to get through it. Oh, As opposed to like, you should be like, get through that and like, I think two hours might be too much time for you. I think, I think right. you should probably be given like half an hour on the air and you're you probably could be, right. Yeah. More efficient with it. But I would also be completely stressed out about timing the, yeah. the entire time. So I don't, I don't, I actually don't want that. But what I want to talk about is beers we've been drinking lately. Let's see how quickly we can go through those. 
Jack, what beer have you been drinking? I've been, been drinking enjoyed? a lot of unfiltered Pilsner Urkel, actually. We just, uh, like you said, we just came from Kaiser Tiger, but uh, two weeks ago uh, out in Lyle, uh, the Bavarian Lodge actually yeah. had it tapped as well. And uh, I dragged my wife out uh, for a date night after like a, a thing at our kids' preschool. And uh, she was a sport, and uh, that was the first time I'd had it. And then just recently this evening as well. It was awesome. Yeah. It's a good beer. Yeah. Good, good beer. So I don't think this was the super duper spectacular flown over on, on filter though is it i don't know i have I no idea the I've, I've seen it I, I thought yeah. i thought that this tasted there are different just, grades of th- unfiltered yeah, there are <laughs> oh yeah they've yeah the, you know, there actually is yeah. yeah and uh the last time i was at i was joking with pat like the last time i was at kaiser was maybe last year or two years ago it was a miller coors event with lisa zimmer was sort of running that uh-huh. where they brought over unfiltered tank uh Pilsner Urquell as well. So basically, I just go to Pat's bar to drink Pilsner Urquell unfiltered. This one, I think, was just a was a pretty was a good one. Was, yeah, it was a good one, but pretty straightforward. I don't yeah. know if it was anything fancy, but it was served out of a windowless van out of the back of the bar. And my mother usually told me to like try to avoid kind of situations like that. But very true. I just don't listen. Cash only. Mm-hmm. Had to have cash. Had <laughs> yeah. to give. Give, give give it to a lady, and then somebody. Then she like signaled somebody else who gave you the beer. It is true. There was mm-hmm. just a gate open, and then a van had pulled up to it, and that was where they were serving the Pilsner Kell out of. So, huh? People seem to be enjoying it. How about you, Adi? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I just uh, uh, was at Corridor uh, on Tuesday brewing a collaboration beer, uh, Omega Maplewood Corridor. Oh, three-way. Um, yeah, it's a three-way. Um and uh, I hadn't been there since Roger had been back um, in April. And what he's doing with um, hoppy, hazy beers there is really... Um, to your liking. Yes. Uh, really, really nice stuff. Very low bitterness. Uh, uh, not very high attenuation, so it's... Not Should we big. get into it right now, Andy? We or can. What? Okay. We can if <laughs> it's up to Might you. as it's well. Now, I'm, I'm letting him finish. No. Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, good stuff. So, uh, Andy is from the, the land of, uh, any, where the, uh, any IPAs are originally yeah. spawned and, um, not the biggest fan of them, right? I know we won't get into it for too long. But. No, I, I, it, I think I tweeted today and just said that they basically taste like garbage juice. Uh, and I was at I was actually at Corridor today. Uh, it sounds like a hot take, but I yeah. don't think that it is. No, I think I, you yeah. thought about that. Yeah, it just uh, and I had I had some you know I had some, I as I said earlier like the best New England IPAs I've ever had, and I can't remember which one it would have been. Uh, I thought it tasted fine, and I never want a second glass of even the best of them. And even people who like them, I say that to them, they say. Yeah, you're right, Mike. But it's still, I don't know if it's about collection, it's about rarity, what it is. But for me, I just, I never want to, they smell great, but I feel like they're beer for people who don't actually like to drink beer. Mm-hmm. It's juice, it's, they're so cloying and I sweet. I can attest that Adi likes to drink beer. I do like to drink beer, mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I, I, I totally uh, see your point. Um, and uh, I think um, I, like, uh, when I've homebrewed myself, I have always preferred um, hoppy beers to be low bitterness. Um, attenuation, I, I, I like everything really dry generally. But um, uh, so sometimes, yeah, a lot of these are, are very sweet, especially when you start adding uh, milk sugar yeah. and stuff. Then I kind of draw the line right there. But um, uh, I'm totally happy to drink um, uh, dry, low bitter beer. Dry, low bitter beer with amazing amounts of aroma. Can you have? Do you want more than one when you drink a New England IPA, um, or do you like one and then you sort of like you like search for pills after that? Uh, uh, sometimes the former, sometimes the latter. Yeah, depends on my mood. Um, but no, I, I, I like them. I don't think um, people freak out about the haze. Uh, I don't think that it needs to be that way. Um, and um, does you it know, need to be hazy, or you don't need to freak out? You don't need to freak out. Um, uh, I was talking to uh, Chris at Transient, and and he uh, was talking about what's he what he's doing with them, and and he he 
change something and uh, in one iteration and it wasn't hazy or as hazy and people freaked out. <laughs> See, that's the sort and, of thing that I hate. Yeah. No, th- th- that's ridiculous. That's completely That happened insane. to <laughs> another beer that we, we brought into the shop and – people expected it to be hazy and you could see through the bottle that it was clear and some of the guys were talking about we mm-hmm. we got to send it back and i said we we can't we cannot i refuse to be the shop that sends back a beer that dropped bright <laughs> we, i can't i can't respect myself for doing no, that no, no, no. You, they're, they're like sorry we actually did our job correctly <laughs> yeah, we didn't right. screw this one up sorry it was funny because <laughs> They were, you know, people were saying, well, they they, they are expecting to be hazy. And it's not going to be hazy. It's not going to be what they want, which mm-hmm. also I, I understood what the what the people were saying. But, yeah, uh, I, I'm yeah. – It's just beer. It, right. <laughs> good good way to end it. Uh, and, uh, Andy, how about you? Anything you've had lately? I mean, you hate everything. So. I do, but I there are some things, you know, that, you hate I, do, less. that I do hate less yes uh, so I got into town yesterday morning and I basically feel like I'm just on a continuous pub crawl for about the next five days through the city my liver already hates me I just want to go for like a 25 mile run around, you know along the lakefront it just uh, I'm trying oh, to run. eat nothing but lettuce while I'm here it's, uh, it didn't really work tonight as we had sausages Some and sausage fries and and, uh, yeah so it's, it's gone downhill Terrible. it's gone downhill already but um I would just say, like, I, you know, since I've been to town, you know, this city, you know, we've talked about it many times. Like, I grew up here from Chicago originally. You know, I was, when I was growing up, it was Hexnut Brown Ale and Goose. That was basically it. That's what you had in this town. And like I said before, you have to go out to Mickey Finn's if you wanted something different. You know, you know that's what it was. Now, every time I'm back, it's 10, 12, 20 new breweries. Within blo- I mean, Goose used to be kind of a dead zone over there. Now you could do an easy pub crawl yeah, easy. within mm-hmm. you know within four or five blocks, and it's it's pretty crazy. But um, so uh, it's always great to come back and and go to traditional places that I love, like Hop Leaf, and I love the Village Tap and Roscoe. Uh, it's, that was sort of the area sort of around where I grew up, and it was just a it's a great neighborhood bar. But yesterday I had sort of an epiphany at um, a Dovetail. I think they're doing amazing stuff there. Uh, I had a lot of you know a lot of great beer, but I had one ounce of beer that I won't say changed my life, but it was a revelatory moment. I had one ounce, and I have to come back and have more of it uh, of the lager, and I understand decoction now. I feel like it was an amazing, creamy, beautiful mouthfeel experience, and they're just doing you know, and just to see a brewery that uses the cool ship for every single batch. Is just a, such an anomaly, even in even in Germany, even in Bavaria, it's a crazy thing to see. But he's doing beautiful beer, and they're nice as can be over there, and they know their stuff, and they are sharp, and can anybody on the staff can walk you through the minutest detail of of that brewing process, and it's something to it's something to be very proud of. They're doing an amazing job over there. Yeah, oh, th- those guys are are super super cool. Um, I guess I'm a little bit un- unprepared for for what I've been drinking lately. I don't I don't know, man. What have I? You know what I've had? I think I had for the first time the scratch beer that was too quote unquote scratchy for me. We've got their wet hop red ale on right now. People have been really digging it. It smells like dirt. I mean, it smells like not garbage, but soil. It smells like the earth so intensely that I'm like, man, am I going to take a sip of it? And it, it tastes, it tastes, I mean, it, it tastes like beer. It's a, it's a red ale. It's, it's hoppy. It's like a very spicy hop. But I was thinking, well, all right, I think this one's a little too, too foragey for me. And uh, I've had plenty of mushroom beers. I've drank beers that I saw like a, a, a spider, like, being boiled alive in the kettle when it was being <laughs> filled up. That just happens sometimes. Yeah, that just happens. But um but yeah, the uh the red hop uh, the wet hop red ale. If you want to try an earthy beer, that is the one to try. I've never drank anything like it. It's uh pretty have you had it, Adi? Do you have Oh it? yeah, no, I had it last time I was at the beer temple, yeah. Yeah. What um, do you think of it? Um I I liked it. Um, uh, I don't know if I got that earthiness so much. It was like very resiny. Um, uh-huh. 
I don't generally like wet hot beers. I used to, but I, I discovered that, that that's not really something that, that I, I enjoy incredibly anymore. Um, but uh, no, it was really nice. Um, it, it was not like super weird to me. Good. All right. Maybe it was just me. Maybe it was the mood I was in that day. <laughs> I'll have to go back and try it, and I'll come back next week and say how much I loved it. It was the <laughs> most perfect scratch grape I've ever had. Uh, so we're ahead of schedule again, so I want to keep keep with this and have uh, producer John tell you about some other shows that are here on Lumpin' Radio that you might be interested in hearing, and then we'll be back with more of the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn. I'm joined by Jack O'Connor, Adi Hastings, and Andy Crouch. And we are um, sitting around, drinking beer, talking about beers we've liked. Way ahead of schedule, so I don't really even have to get to the next topic, but I will. (coughs) At this point, I'm just worried that we're going to run out of stuff to talk about. Uh, It is – so it was – a topic that we I brought up last week, and people were very um, adamant, and they had a lot of opinions, <laughs> and apparently people were irate in the chat room uh, per Jack, and it was uh, I, I've modified I've modified the the question a, slightly, um, which is what is the most significant craft beer, and I put flavorful beer for for you, Andy, because I do like that term. So, what is the most significant craft beer? to have come out in the past 25 years. Um, so I would never betray the chat, first of all, <laughs> as, a re- <laughs> as a chat room regular. Uh, but somebody brought up last week when, when the discussion was happening, and now the question is if, if it's specific to craft, quote-unquote, um, whether this would count. Uh, but I think Lagunitas IPA ought to be in that discussion, for sure, because I think at least here... Um, but I think more than more than that, almost nationwide, it's it's a style and ubiquitous. Just it's everywhere, and you can't. And Chicago now, uh, since they opened their brewery, like you can't go anywhere without seeing Lagunitas IPA available. Um, I think it belongs sort of in that conversation. I don't know if anybody as, else does. As number one, I, I think it's a contender for sure. I would I would put it. I don't know. I, I made like a short list, sort of as I was listening to uh, Tom with his twenty-five Tom Quarter top of Penrose, twenty-five yeah. last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of thinking of it, thinking of it, and I think a lot of I, I think starting the conversation with Hetty Topper made sense, but I think Lagunitas IPA is is in the conversation for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes, for those of you out there, I who didn't listen last week or or for those of you here who didn't listen last week i had said that the question was is heady topper the most significant beer to come out in the last 25 years and um my thinking being that it's really set the stage certainly in the past five years very heavily but i think it's it's influenced how all hoppy beers are, are kind of trending they're trending towards less bitterness more but that exotic was exotic hops, and, and the point was made. I think is heady topper is not low bitterness. It is it is a balanced beer, and it's got right. A but good it had that of kind of like sweet yeasty. Well, it was yeasty. Mm-hmm. It had some sweetness to it. It it was definitely different. It was unlike. I remember the first time I was having it. People were saying, "Is it is you know is it amazing? Is it the best beer in the world?" Because you know it surpassed West Valeteran as the number one beer advocate beer and stuff like that, and that was a big deal at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, it was ve- it was certainly unique. I remember saying, which is ironic now because there's so many of these uh, uh, New England beers that I feel like are just interchangeable of one another. Mm-hmm. But back then, it was fairly singular it was the only thing i'd ever had the taste of like that and i felt like if you gave me 100 ipas i could at least pick out one and that would have been heady topper because it tasted so different from everything else and and i'm not saying that new england ipa is the most popular style but i do see the big guys now going low bitterness high hops um and before that you know there was the big west coast thing which was super aggressive very high bitterness and um the ibu wars yeah, the IBU wars. I, I feel like they. I feel like 
the New England IPAs are actually a lot of noise, a lot of fire without a lot of substance to it. I think that we as beer geeks talk about New England IPAs, but I think and you see it certainly at the places we go to. If you're at a Trillium Beer Garden or something along those lines, you definitely see it. Or if you're on Instagram or online, it it sucks up a lot of the oxygen out of the room. But in reality, I don't know that I see a lot of the big guys doing that. I mean, I don't see – I don't even – Well, see, not hazy and juicy, but I mean kind of uh, – Sam did it though. Well, they yeah, tried they to, did. At least with that – Rebel Raw series, yeah. but sort of, but not. I mean, it was really half-hearted, and because that you know, Rebel IPA was just a big, fat, flabby <laughs> attempt at a style ten years too late. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know that you know it. I think Lagunitas IPA. Obviously, I think Tony was and Lagunitas were the first to put IPA on a label, and it is mm-hmm. a beer that has been a slow. Yeah, it's an, it's you know the world's longest overnight were they success. Really the, the first to put. Yeah, it I think on they were the first. Yeah, the first. Mm, no, no, they, they protected. They, they're, like it was. They're, they're, they're were, uh, I'm trying to. Remember. They're an there old a, brewery. No, there was some place in uh, '92 or something. That, 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 right. had, that had that had some high, actual uh, that had actual distribution. Uh, no, it was okay. actually, so maybe like, there like right. because coast I, or something. I mean, because there are places that you just had IPA in their yes. tap room, and that was and they, along with their amber and their brown. But like to take okay. that and actually, he you know, Lagunitas needs to get some props for for doing that. But I feel like it's only in the last seven or eight years that Lagun. I mean, Lagunitas went from like sort of this tiny little brewery and that was doing fine, and then it just out of nowhere just shot up like crazy, um, and. You know, eventually, you know, sold out. Like that's kind of what it was built for. It was almost like a tech, you know, startup. At, you know, or that was twenty five years in the making. Um, but in terms, so I think Lagunitas one hundred percent deserves to be right mm-hmm. in there. Especially, you know, whereas I think New England IPA and Hetty are just niche of a niche of a niche. And maybe they will. It portends what the future will hold. I don't know if it's going to be a trend or a fad. But Lagunitas IPA and IPA is, is undoubtedly mm-hmm. where the game is at right now, I'm, for better or worse. I would say for worse. Like, I don't like that we have such a singular conversation about a single style and, and that and that brewers – I mean, I hear these stories all the time and read them all the time. We started out making uh, Belgian saisons and beer to guard yeah. and things like that. And then they'd come in the tap room and say, where's your IPA? And then six months later, after we weren't selling anything, we are now a New England IPA brewery. Or you made jerk. German styles and nobody was buying Dunkel and and you know that's why you see a place like Dovetail and you're like I hope and pray they can continue to to do well and in a city like Chicago with so many breweries maybe if you focus niche like that but in a lot of places you open up and you try to do these other fun styles or interesting styles let alone trying to do something like an ESB or something like that and you just get murdered for it and all customers want is IPA whether it's hazy or not hazy and that's you know, that's very sad to me. But I, in terms of. It's funny of- you should say that. We'll, we'll get back to what you were going to say because I think there was a lot of meat on the bone right there. Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody just just a couple of days ago who was saying, in so many words, the exact same thing. They were talking at one point about how they were kind of, you know, happy with where one of their Cezannes was doing, but they weren't really going to put any more effort into growing that beer. Uh, they were at another point talking about there was this, you know, uh, honey beer, the beer to meal, meal that, you know, people didn't understand and didn't want to listen to. And, and, and this was kind of the, the identity that this brewery had started as and how they were, you know, focusing more on now stouts, IPAs and barrel fermented, you know, sours and wild ales, which With is fruit. Right. And it's we were talking about how the the market has at the same time exploded and contracted where there's so many breweries. There are so many. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking about it, Andy, uh, how many there are here that you never heard of. There were people I was talking to um, – my insurance guy today telling me about some brewery called Kings and Convicts or something mm. like that. Oh. I 
Yeah. I, I never. Heard I just of heard about them this week. I think are they in the? They're in like the northwest suburbs. Yeah, I, I never, never heard of northwest them. suburbs. Yeah. yeah. And this is the never this is the crazy thing is that you can come into a town and expect somebody like yourself to be as wired as you get running a bottle shop, running a tap room now. And I come in and I'll talk to you about something. And I just see your eyes like glaze over, nope. like you have no idea what I'm <laughs> no talking idea. about. It's like how do you not know about this? Because and then I try to like you look on Beer Advocate, you look on Untapped, you look on Rate Beer, you look on whatever source you have, and they still can't cover it. And so. Mm. You know, and somebody said tonight, I think it was Jack who said, like, no, Instagram's where it's at. That's the only way you can, because that's the place where they show an identity. That's the place where they show what the tap room's going to look like, what the build out is. And that is actually, oddly enough, how I found I went to uh, On Tour Brewing tonight, All which right. I guess has only been open for a short period of time. But uh, I found them because I was looking in Goose did, I think, a sponsored ad on Instagram saying you could take a a, a, brewer, a brewery crawl in their neighborhood now, and they cited all the breweries. And I was like, what is on t- I've never even heard of this. Mm-hmm. And I do all my research before I come to town. I'm all over Google Maps. You go into Google Maps and you type in brewery, you would assume you should be able to get everything. It, you don't. There are still dozens that it's not catching until I see some crazy. random Instagram ad. Yeah. That, Come on, that breweries. Them. Get on Google. I mean, <laughs> yeah. for real. But the other side of that is how it's contracting is all these breweries are just focusing on a couple styles. <laughs> and it's IPA, 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 IPA. And I'm calling up Hoppy Pale and IPA. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just. It's, uh, I, I, IPA and adjunct stouts. There, yeah. There you go. That's that's one hundred percent of the business for um, the yeast. a, n- a yeah. number of of, of breweries. Which, and you know, we we um, working in Omega, we we uh, often I'm aware of a lot of these breweries opening because they come to us for yeast. I'm like, I've never heard of this place, and I look up. Oh, they're not even open yet. Um, right, but um, uh, it's it's we get. So I mean, we're getting new clients, you know, in Chicago, but also nationally and stuff. And so, I learn about you know these breweries in, you know, the middle of Ohio. That I've, I'm like, I, I don't even know what's there. Like, <laughs> is there a yeast stout? Can you tell from their yeast purchases what what beers they're doing? Or no, uh, no, no. Especially if they, uh, well, you know, there the, there are two two approaches to this. Um, one one is to buy. One or two strains and make a number of different styles. Pretty of that. classics um, approach. The, the other is, um, and and this is when you know the brewery is opened by uh, a home brewer, um, which is <laughs> that they order seven different strains <laughs> to start with, and you're like, you haven't even tested your brew house yet, and you're ordering yeast. Like, just hold hold off. <laughs> Maybe order one pitch, see how it goes. <laughs> right. But um, we we have so many calls now that uh, that's advice we used to give, and we don't have time to like do that anymore. Just sort of be like, oh no no no, Wait, hold on, just just get one strain and <laughs> see how that goes. I would say, in terms of your question of like, what is that influential beer or whatever, however you phrased it, um, I would give two possible other suggestions. I think the other ones you've given are good. Um, the first one would be Two Hearted. Yeah. Because Two Hearted yeah. has sort of started that rarity kick that you know that we are now on, and started a while ago. It's kind of like Coors was fifty years ago, where people would bootleg it to the East Coast. You know, you had a friend who was going out there, having bring a couple of cases back for you because you heard about this crazy beer that was made in the mountains. Um, you know, Two Hearted is that sort of even now is you know I was just looking on Beer Advocate's you know most popular uh, you know beers, the number one. You know, what do you think the we just out of curiosity, what do you guys think is the most rated beer on Beer Advocate? Most, most rated? rated? Yeah, most rated. Has the most ratings, period. Now that's an Utopious. interesting question. <laughs> Hold on. Let's – we all get we, we all get one we all get one answer, but we have to think quickly because we can't take forever I think figuring it's too it hearted. out. I mean, I think it's too probably close to too hearted, but let's assume it's not too okay. hearted. Too hearted is in the top five. We'll just okay. say that. It's number four. Okay. Dust. So My answer is Dust. Dust. No, <laughs> I think it's got to be an oh, Pliny. Pliny. Dust is number seven, is number 19. So that's oh, a good wow. guess. Close. Pliny is number three. This actually blows my mind. It's Founder's Breakfast Out. It's oh, got 17,000 really? reviews. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, which, of course, is nothing compared to Untap, which basically every beer that's a ever seasonal. been released has 50,000 reviews on right, Untap. Right, right. But uh, you know, I would say, say Two Hearted is one of those beers. And then another one I think is Sierra Nevada Celebration. 
It was yeah. one of the first seasonal beers that really caught on. And year after, you know, seasonal beer is now kind of dead. But, like, in its time, seasonal beer was a huge thing. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, Sierra, and between that and, and, like, Liberty Ale from Anchor, were two beers that really kind of transformed Americans' understanding of what bitterness is, about hops. And that's a beer that today, I mean, I do 95% of my beer drinking out uh, you know, I'm in bars, I'm in restaurants, wherever. I don't really drink a lot of beer at home. I drink a lot of whiskey and a lot of bourbon at home. Um, but if I only go to the store, liquor store, twice a year to actually buy beer. And you know, one of those is Sierra Oktoberfest. The other one is Sierra Silva Celebration. And that is, I buy those two, usually 12 packs or a case of it. And it lasts, and also, Celebration will last you for some time. Like that, yeah. that is good. Mm-hmm. Even a year or two later, that still tastes just. It's a mm-hmm. different profile, but like the hops drop out, malt comes in. It's beautiful. But I'd I'd give votes for for those two those two beers for a celebration and two hearted. Yep. I, I would I would add um, Boulevard's Tank Seven. Yeah. Uh, really? Oh yeah. man. I I uh, past twenty five years. Yeah. The most significant beer. Uh, um. Uh. One of the first uh, popularly available American made saisons. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's a niche. It's not like, you know, Lagunitas IPA. Um. But I that think is a way it, in, though. That is that is a beer. That's one of those beers that got me in. Yeah, that's, to craft beer. It, for it's sure. One of those things where, like, no, it's not just all about hops and malt and stuff. And and you you give some some yeast forward. Like really expressive beer, and that 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 was the sort of model for American saisons for mm-hmm. a while. Like high ABV, like seven or eight percent, yeah, a little sweeter. Um, I mean, that the trend is moving away from that, thank God, right uh, now. But um, you know, I th- I think that was a significant beer, and it's still great. I mean, it's uh, and now you can get it in like twelve ounce bottles, so and, and you can get it anywhere. Yeah, and you can mm-hmm. get it anywhere. Um, I mean that that's one of the things that I've noticed um from all the beers with the exception of maybe celebration is that all your beers that you guys have mentioned are now basically very widely available. I don't know if Two Hearted or or Boulevard are in all 48 mm-hmm. states. I don't think they are, but they're in a big chunk of of states mm-hmm. now. Chris, I have I have some concerns for you. Why? How many states are there? Well, forty. Yeah. I'm just just contiguous. just just asking. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm just forty eight contiguous. Yeah. I don't don't know your background, education levels. I don't want to assume things, but I was. Why concerned. didn't anybody say Dark Lord last week? That Dark that Lord. seems to make some sense. to Someone me, said just Bourbon County. Of, yeah, that makes sense too for the same sort of reason. Where it's an event, it it seems to me like it's one of the first festival event. Stand in a line. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go. You're not uh-huh. necessarily just there because. Because you're going to get this beer, you're there because there's something happening around it. It's a big culture. It was a big yeah. cultural thing. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's if you want to talk about influence, I think that that deserves an, it, a place in there too. The beer release, the big yeah. beer release yes. thing, the beer as beer release as event. Yeah, I mean, is that the first beer that was really truly an event that you guys can think of when it got released? Uh, it certainly is an annual thing. I think yeah. so. Yeah, that or Black Tuesday. Yeah, and um, I mean, it's, I think they're about the same time. I would go, I mean, because I can remember, I mean, I'm old enough that I can remember going down to Munster in November or December when I come back for Thanksgiving or Christmas to visit my folks here and driving down there. And you could just, I mean, this was long before they were doing any fancy thing with with the events, but you could just sit there and drink Dark Lord in the, just in the brewery. You could also get growlers of it, I think. I remember it was a grower was like 18 bucks back then. And I was like, that is insane. Who is going to pay that kind of money <laughs> what for a year grower? Was this? I, it was probably 40, 1948, somewhere in yeah, there. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was pretty, it was a while ago. And I also remember the first time, I, I mean, that's one of those beers, though, that I remember where I was, when I was, when I first had it. And I was standing mm-hmm. in, in a frozen, uh, you know, brewery distribution building at, 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 uh, uh, at the brewery there. And the first sip, it was so thick and so viscous. It was like motor oil, and I'd never tasted it. And it, to this day, I don't know that I've ever had a beer that was that like just thick. Um, and it was it was revelatory. 
and I wanted two ounces of it and no more of it. And I've, and I've not changed off of that opinion ever. But uh, I, I agree. I think you probably have to broaden your question to like, what are the five or ten most influential breweries or beers for whatever reason? And Dark Lord's going to be in that top five for setting that rarity, that event thing that we now see all the, you know, on, at least on Instagram and on Everything. social everywhere. And that was, if not the first as close to it as I can think of. And, and even for starting to, to set the stage for brewery um, beer festivals, really, mm-hmm. because it became a beer festival that, that started out as a line. But before Dark Lord Day, can you think of any brewery beer fests? And now there's tons of breweries yep. are doing beer fests now. Um, that was kind of the first. They kind of mm-hmm. set the stage there. So so we have Lagunese IPA. I'll, I'll I'll say they're Chicago because they are kind of <laughs> Bourbon County. Okay, that was in Chicago, and we had um, Dark Lord. I'll consider them Chicago too. I'm very, I'm very mm. loose. Yeah, <laughs> I think we see a trend here, guys. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's accurate, but you know, we can connect the, the get the the red string and connect all those those points together. Um, so. Let's get into what the show is really about, which is um, a, a obscure acquisitions of Australian breweries <laughs> from uh, venture capital firms. Oh, God. Uh, I just wanted to th- see if um, any of you guys had any thoughts on ZX Ventures' latest acquisition or if this was just a more – to me, it, it less – the specifics of it, but just the fact that ZX Ventures is continuing to buy breweries outside the U.S. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on this, Adi, one way or um, another? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that um, uh, it's it's trying to do a similar thing that they've done in the United States where, um, I mean, they already own Carlton Brewery uh, breweries in, in, in Australia, right? Which are make Foster's and Victoria bitters and all of the sort of, um, uh, macro loggers that you can find there. Um, and, um, I think, uh, you know, um, Australia is a different case than the United States a little bit. Cause you have a, a high presence of like Japanese capital, um, there as well. Um, I think uh, one of those articles that you sent out, like, was talking about um, Kirin and Asahi, um, who had been trying, who had been yeah. like buying other breweries. So clearly, like, um, you know, multinational brewing companies are trying to sort of enter the uh, Australian craft beer market, which is not as mature as it is here in the United States, but I think there's a you lot You want to get him while the getting's good. Yeah, no, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going Nipping on. Nipping the bud, I it's, think, it's really. It's exploding. Like, so, kill yeah, this it's, before it starts. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's 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 uh, hard not to sort of jump to conclusions about what the sort of That's what this show is game. truly all about. I mean, let's be real now. <laughs> That's what this show is about. So jump, man. Yeah, no, I think I think they're trying to get in and um uh you know, uh co-opt the this kind of um uh, uh aura of sort of craft beer, independent, uh sort of flavorful beer. Um Yeah, and there was even an, an interview an interview with the owner of the uh Australian brewery Four Pines and he was saying I think it was two or three yeah. years ago that you know the big guys haven't been able to crack into the local scene because they're not seen as well as the craft scene because they're not seen as local they're not seen right. as craft they're not right. seen as anything and you know here they are they're finding they just okay well, mm. we'll just well buy it. Um, somebody it, shows up with a big bag of money yeah I mean you, you they have you, a big you, bag of money <laughs> they're throwing money at you it's it's hard not to pay attention <laughs> and I mean as they as you know in the U S we're you know, we have, what, 6,000, 6,500 breweries strong trying to come in and, you know, AB a- for 20 plus years with Budweiser American Ale, with Shock Top, with all of the Michelob Pale Ale and stuff like that. They tried to replicate what craft brewers are doing, and they often did it in a very cartoonish, ridiculous, cloddy kind of way. And they and it was just very clumsy all the time. And then they finally got smart and bought – goose for what now seems like a pittance at 38 million dollars mm-hmm. uh and built that into more than half a you know half a million barrels of, of beer and then they now have their 10 breweries around the country or so and they've now said 
at least in one interview, that they're done with acquisitions in the States and they're going to try to build those breweries for a while, which I think is probably smart. And we'll see if they continue along those lines. But in countries around the world, and Australia has a, a bit of a developed beer market, a bit of a developed craft beer market they have for 15 or 20 years. Um, but you get into places like Taipei, Hong Kong, uh, mm-hmm. Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, through through Africa, through a lot of the world that does not have a defined beer, craft beer presence, flavorful beer presence. And they're going to come in there and put in – Goose Island mm-hmm. uh, brew houses, Goose Island tap rooms in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in wherever. And that is what is going to teach the local people about what craft beer is. And it's not that China doesn't have craft brewers. It, it certainly does. But they're small in a massive country, and they don't have the capital that AB does, ABI does. And they come in and, and will define that local scene. So they're not going to have the pushback that you're going to see in the states here. Mm-hmm. Will those countries then develop to have – the importance of craft beer, you know, beer culture that we have in the States, or is it going to be an ABI kind of watered down version of that? I don't know, but you know, that's what's probably going to happen. Cause I think in the States they have the breweries they probably need to dominate their, you know, the regions of the country. I don't know that they need, I mean, they're not going to buy 50 or a hundred or 200 or 300 breweries. Why, why do that when they can blast all goose IPA out of Baldwinsville, New York and, plaster the east coast with it so well yeah and they're they're opening um uh brewery like brew pubs mm-hmm. uh, uh branded brew pubs like 10 barrel is opening brew pubs up and down the west coast now mm-hmm. um they just opened the goose um brew pub in london I think. Al- also is goose doing one in the city i was talking to somebody last night who said that goose was also doing well, the, one reopening, the, the, the reopening the reopening the, the, the Clyburn. oh yeah. that was that was it okay but they're doing one in in Seoul. They're doing one yeah. in China. Yeah, they're yeah. doing one, I believe, in Vietnam. No, it's going to be an international brand of like you know craft beer, like I, Goose Island IPA three one two. Yeah, in nice. fact, the president of Goose it, it was now yeah made, Ken Ken Stout. Yeah, he's now the the president of Goose International. Yeah. So I mean, that's had, a really interesting story, actually. Josh Noel had like a series of tweets earlier this week, sort of tracking the map of how that came to be because he was like childhood friends i think with greg hall yeah oh right? that yeah. that's the the oh, individual no, who's taking over for yeah, yeah. Go, for goose yeah, in, okay yeah. Yeah. sorry goose us mm. uh but yeah that no, was no, stupid no no <laughs> no you're exactly you're exactly right josh did a really interesting that's yeah. an interesting work and actually i'll um, I know we're not supposed to plug things here, but I have absolutely no financial interest mm-hmm. in anything. But like Josh is coming out with a book in a you know in a few months here that'll be the Goose Island story that I think is mm. as a beer writer I'm incredibly interested and someone who has followed Goose for a long time. I think it's going to be really revelatory. It's going to be really interesting to see what his thoughts are because he is a smart, you know, hard reporter uh, who has who's not afraid to have some you know good takes on things. So I'm I'm very curious to see how. How that book turns out, and and uh, and I think we could use all the more reporting because I think things are getting interesting now. You know, for I got to tell you, when I was writing ten years ago in this you know communal like everyone's happy with each other time, that's not a lot of fun. Like mm-hmm. wine writing is awesome because it's like fratricide. You get the Mandavis, you got all these families that just hate each other. There's a brother <laughs> who broke off and opened his own winery. Like everybody in the wine business hates each other. I can't wait till craft beer gets like that because that's going to be so amazing for me to cover. And I think we're on the precipice of it. So I, I can't wait to, to report on all of the, all the blood and internecine is it, fights. Is it more interesting now, less interesting, or just different than when you first started? Oh, it's 100% more interesting now because literally before, everyone was just happy. And they're like, oh, everyone's my buddy. And now you're like, no, Dogfish Head sold 15% to PE. Forget them. They're the worst. Uh, you know, These guys are bought out by these guys. I'm driving through the city. And you just you see all the neons. You're like founders, like they're not craft anymore. All these things, like there's and everyone. And then you have these three, four thousand new breweries run by a bunch of millennials who just are like Fritz Maytag, who, like Ken right. Grossman, <laughs> what Sierra? That's my it's my grandfather's beer. Like nobody drinks that stuff. All I want is haze. All I want is flour in my beer. I want it to look ugly, like a jar of tang. They don't understand that reference either. But uh, <laughs> right, right. but it just uh, it's. I think it's going to be a fascinating time. I like 
when people have a little bit of color, a little bit of fun, a little bit of uh, different opinions. I think this whole everyone playing nice for so long was real boring. And now I think it's we're in it for a bloodbath. And it's all like local now. These breweries, you know, like Ballast Point writing down almost $200 million worth of, or, you know, Constellation writing down $200 million worth that because things went local. It's great. It's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Now, do you think, why do you think that stuff is going to be a bloodbath is it because there's just more money and that there's just not not enough there's a there's a hundred reasons people there's a hundred reasons for that first of all you have so many breweries that are now competing for a limited you know this on the front lines limited number of tap handles limited, limited number of shelf space or floor space um in the cold box wherever and these big breweries that have have multiple locations now whether you're new belgium or sierra are now seeing flat growth or negative growth. Nobody wants to drink Boston Beer Company. Are they going to be bought by some, you know, by Molson Coors? What's going to happen? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But nobody cares about the pioneers. Nobody cares about the heritage brands. Uh, All you care about is your local tiny place, you know, one week old beer right now. And that's what people are interested in. Will that trend continue? I don't know. But everyone does basically 16 ounce cans of some sort of IPA, and that's I mean, you know, that's really the world we're in. The, all that people are interested in is the one week old tiny stuff. I mean, what what share of the of overall craft beer, even or flavorful beer, we'll call it, not craft beer, because I don't want to get into definitions, but flavorful beer is that? I would still say it's a tiny percentage. Yeah, no, it's a tiny percentage. I mean, yeah. most of the so people that's that, not all what people care. No, about. when they talk about you know craft beer um, is twelve percent of the market or whatever like that, um, uh, the people that are buying the one week old local hazy IPA are like less than one percent of the yeah. <laughs> that, um, and it's it's you know it's the bigger getting bigger, and there's only so much. Well, the beer big, to be the, sold. The big aren't getting bigger. That's the issue. Is that you know mm-hmm. you they might be twelve percent of the market. You know, craft all the sixty five hundred craft brewers, or whatever the number is right now. But I don't know. Eighty percent of that is in the top fifty breweries or something mm-hmm. like that. And a lot of those guys are flat. And yeah, right. what is going to happen? What's the future of well, those but guys? Well, Lagunitas is getting bigger. Founders is getting bigger. Ballast Point is still is growing. Even though those are right mm-hmm. down, they're still growing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but a lot of those Goose guys are getting bigger. A lot of those guys, and Goose is reasonably flat. With you know, they hit six hundred thousand barrels right. in the states, mm-hmm. and they kind of went flat. Right now, will these guys? Uh, you know, Tony at Lagunitas, he doesn't care about the states. His eyes are Europe and the rest of the world, as they as well they should be. And that mm-hmm. that brand and that company understands that Lagunitas is was an IPA that maybe did well here in the states, but they're going to go global with that thing. And they may yeah. be they may they and Goose may define IPA. Next you know, twenty five years, yeah, going in forward, in right? in across Africa, across Asia, across your uh, parts of Europe, like that is maybe where the future is for those guys. But you look at you know places, you know Sierra has stumbled a bit. New Belgium, I was just down there a couple months ago, and I have been a big New Belgium fan for decades, and it's sad to see what's happening there. That day blazer or whatever day breaker day blazer, where yeah. they're basically it's a fight to the bottom on pricing for them mm-hmm. for just a sad beer. Uh, they're doing line extensions for uh, fat tire in Belgian white because uh, because that's what people want right now is is a shock top knockoff fifteen years too late. Uh, so these are beers like yeah we've you, talked about that and then <laughs> you yeah and then you see the other stuff and then you see you know whatever 60% or 65% of Boston beers production is twisted tea and spiked seltzer for people who don't want to drink alcohol and don't want to know they're drinking alcohol like it's sad days for some of these places places like Sierra are still I give them great respect but still even they, first time they've been down in the history of the yeah of the brewery. It's, and so this for the for year. those big guys that's what I'm talking about a bloodbath I don't really care about how corridor is doing versus the place next door to it they're tiny they're they're pittance. Uh, you know, they, if you make 500 barrels or 1,000 barrels or 2,000 barrels, you're basically meaningless in the grand scheme of beer in this country. But these big breweries, like 50, 100, 100 uh, in the top 100, ooh, it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch. And and they're buying each other. They're getting bought by other people. Will some of these people go under? Will they have problems? I don't know. Like it's going to be it's going to be fun, interesting times. And it's not community. Everyone slaps their backs and is happy. Do you think the the regional brewery as it as it existed maybe um, in the the fifties and forties or even r- more recently is 
is there a a longevity for that or is there going to be no such thing as the the regional brewery where there's a craft brewery who is you know has this like tri-state area or this one region where it's got a following but then outside of it it's just it's really just not the thing it's not available and it's I, not I, necessarily a, a, a coveted thing but it's just this is where you go to get it and people care about it there yeah, I, I, I don't know if that model is sustainable um, for the regional brewery size. I, I think if you're if you're doing a thousand barrels uh, a year, like you've got a tap room, you, you're you're fine. Um, uh, you're not I'm going to make like, like seventy five thousand barrels. Yeah, no, like seventy five thousand mm-hmm. barrels. It's it, you're right at that cusp. I think where it's it's you've got to expand in order to sort of keep going um, and. There, you're you start running up against all of these regional and national breweries, and and that's where I think, um, like you were saying, I think that's where the bloodbath comes. Uh, it's um, those breweries that I think you, you, you they are in a place. It's like sharks or something. They got to keep like growing <laughs> to survive, and you can only do that so much. So is that then the model? You just keep growing until you die or kill everybody else. I mean, that's just how it is. That's capitalism. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean if you're not just going to be a mom and pop store locally, like it, you know, it, you, it's all about scale. It's all about trying to get efficiencies. Uh, you even, I mean, this happens with AB, ABI, like ABI is not, they make a ton of money, but what do they do? They acquire, they grow, they continue to try to grow. Why? In part, because they have shareholders, you know, it's sure. a publicly traded public, company. Yeah. But even still, if, even if they are privately held, the, nobody's ever happy just having like one store or one, you know, these, they, they, it's all about trying to build, you know, if you're a place that's making a thousand or 1500 barrels or 500 barrels and selling it over the bar at your place, you and your spouse or your partner, or whatever it is, can make a reasonable living. You're not going to get crazy rich, but no. you can do okay. If you then try to get to 5,000 barrels and you have 10 employees and you have all the stainless steel that goes along with that and the canning and everything else, you now have debt. You now have investors. Investors want returns, and investor that feeds it and feeds mm-hmm. it. And then maybe you want to buy them out. And to do that, you need to like sustain growth. And then maybe you need to go to a bank and get more money, or you need to like eventually get to private equity. And it is it never stops. If you want to, if you want to have that mom and pop shop, you'll probably be happy. But uh, a lot of those people, even with the mom and pop shops, they want uh, you know mobile canning. And so now they're in the marketplace. And once they start doing that, well, we maybe want to try to get in some more places or it's a little more expensive to do this. Maybe we want to contract someplace or maybe we want a bigger facility or we want a production facility. And then it just snowballs. Like this and is you all – look f- back and say, is this what I wanted? Yeah. And then t- <laughs> 15 years later, you're scared to death because you now have $20 million in debt to a bank that you're servicing or a line of credit that you're servicing. Or worse, of venture capital. Was yeah. Doing in three years. Yes, and exactly. Who, who, yeah, who walks into the room backwards with I, their eyes on the door. Right, right. right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I do want to mention you are listening to WLPN LP Chicago, 105.5 FM Lumpen Radio. And we, I am sitting here. With my guests Jack O'Connor, Adi Hastings, and the beer scribe himself, Andy Crouch, and I am your host, Chris Quinn. I think it's about time for us to take a little bit of a music break. What do you think about that, John? You ready for that? Uh, John has been <laughs> working without any headphones all show. I've been giving him a lot of crap, but he has not been, let's say, set up to succeed so far, but... Uh, I think he'll make up for it with his choice musical selections. He usually he usually is pretty good with this. We'll see. I don't know. Some deep cuts, huh? Producer John, dig it. You're listening to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn, and I am joined by Jack O'Connor, Adi Hastings of Omega East Labs, and Andy Crouch of um, Beer Writing World. Um Jack, you are uh, where are you? Oh, you have your own uh, podcast as well, right? It's uh, oh, again, no, no mic for, for you, Jack. Now, now, maybe trying to keep me down. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> I do. Yeah. How's that been going? Uh, it's fine. Uh, we've done. We do uh, record once a month with uh, a the couple session of or what's it called? Yeah. It, this is something that I've, I've been learning. When I tell people the name of the show, they then repeat it back: sessional instead of sessionable. Uh, it's called sessionable discourse. 
sessionable uh, yeah, discourse. Just me and two of my friends hang out in a garage and we drink beer and talk about whatever we're interested in interested in that month but uh we always do like a beer segment up front and then we play a game like a board game no uh <laughs> it's uh it's a game where <laughs> we're, like game? W- what we do is we end up uh we choose something that is our favorite so it'll be like who's your favorite marvel superhero and you get to just say your choice and the other two people on the show get to basically make fun of you for it uh, and you don't get to defend your choice. You just get to say I would what it be, is. I'd be good at that game, especially if you're telling me <laughs> who your favorite. Yeah, super. It's fun. Is. Um, cool. I'd say, how old are you? Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's. Uh, so, do you guys? Uh, let me let me throw it to you because I know Andy will have no problem telling me that all of these topics are boring and suck. Well, they do. And actually, I was going to suggest a different topic. <laughs> yeah, go, go. Okay. <laughs> Along the lines of who's your favorite, I was wondering, since I, you know, I've got three local guys here, I was curious, like, what it, you know, who are your favorite brewers in Chicago? And actually, more importantly, I'd like to segue into the topic of who do you guys think and w- are you willing to admit on the air who's making bad beer in Chicago? Ooh, okay. That'll get real quiet. So where do, we, where do we go first? Who are our favorite beers? That's an sure. easy one, right? Okay. Does everyone want me to go first? Or I talk about my favorite breweries all the time. Um, I'll, I'll go. Yeah. Half Acre. Um, Agree. Easily. Uh, yeah. I mean, just in terms of, like, consistently yep. good stuff. Um, a couple of misfires every now and then. But uh, everything that they put in cans is I would say worth uh, drinking. I, I was going to agree. If there is any brewery that is going to put out a new – Let's say like a, a seasonal. This is going to be mm-hmm. our new because they don't do like month long seasonals. Mm-hmm. They do full like half a year yeah, yeah. or a third of a year seasonals. And if there's any brewery that if a new one's coming out, you know it's going to be great. The most recent one that I can think of where I really hadn't had any experience with it prior to it coming out in cans was tuna. Yeah. And you just knew, oh, it's going to be. It's going to be fire, and it, yeah. it was. That, that You're was not going great. To shy that was away in my refrigerator it. for most of the summer. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of like that was that took that segment, and it was the best at it. And everyone else just kind of immediately was trying to compete with it. And I heard people saying to me all summer long, "Well, yeah, but I mean, tuna. There's tuna. There's if you want the low, I uh, low alcohol hoppy beer that that they just kind of crushed it. So I totally agree with you." On a half acre, yeah, yeah. Uh, they will, the, their sour and wild program that they've put out a couple of things now is mm-hmm. is mind blowingly good. Uh, just just insane. Where did that for, come from? Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, Nowhere. it's just like nuts. they didn't tell anybody about it until they were ready to. It seemed like 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 here it is, and they're no just big doing deal. So <laughs> little of it. It's just such yeah. a weird little thing that they're they're doing. I know they've been working on it for a while, but um, yeah. So I I totally agree agree with you there. Uh, I think we should follow up then and ask you uh, who's making bad beer in Chicago. Me personally, yeah. yeah. I think I think you should go one positive, one negative. Okay. Um, who is making bad beer in Chicago? That is a harder one to answer now than it has been before because you run a tap room now and you don't want to like upset people, or is it politics, no, or no, do you no, just? No. I, thinking... I believe in constructive criticism. Sure, or, or criticism, either one, but they're both <laughs> right. Good. Right, I think there are are breweries that aren't necessarily inspiring to me, that don't really interest me. Um, that I kind of I'm like, well, what's going on with you guys? I'm I'm trying to think of of who that would be for me right now. I will f- I will come up with one. I promise you. Um, I'm not trying to. You know what? For me, honestly. Someone who does not interest me personally, I th- I've heard they do very, very well in the suburbs, is Two Brothers. They don't really... It's, it's not it, exciting. It's not. I, I would agree that it's... It really excites me. I just, I don't know. Something about their beer just does not I do, do it like for me. I do like Domain DuPage, though. I, right. I'll agree with you that, it, like, I think I said it, that it's not exciting, but it's it's it, there's nothing that stands out that I can just go and get that I wouldn't you know prefer half acre or pipeworks or revolution to as as something that I'm going to 
yeah, pick up off the, the shelf. Beer writer. Regular. Just oh, I remember when Josh was on trying to do the same thing. Just like ask people to say things that are going to be incendiary and upset people. <laughs> All we want is quotes. That's what we're always <laughs> right. looking for. We want that money quote. Right. Uh, I'll play the game as well. Yeah, so yeah. I, at the no, end, I, 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 I uh, with the two brothers, I say I would say um, uh, the one exception to that is their uh, Brett beer, the Bretter Day. I haven't um, had it. Yeah. Which um, I mean, I you, you, they're selling that in grocery stores, and you have like, you know, like suburban couples like taking a six pack of like a, a Brett beer yeah. home, and and super that, cool. That's like amazing. And I think <laughs> I, let me let me clarify a little bit because there have been times where they've put out great beers Mm -hmm. and i feel like i also can't trust them to not mess with their beers that are great i feel that i've had cain and abel which i thought was the example of Mm -hmm. of a red ipa and then i had it again recently i was like what is this beer why of all things did you mess with this beer and they did it with their um that that extra pale ale that was like during the session, you know what I was talking to is yeah. it Sidekick? Is Sidekick. That, Sidekick. They the used to make that, that all the time, it and was, I haven't seen it in a long time. I used to drink that beer frequently. Well, <laughs> they made it again, and it wasn't nearly as good as when they first made it. And it was so good that first summer, and they made it again, and it was. Uh, uh, you just have to ask yourself: you had lightning in a bottle, you had, or in a can, you had mm-hmm. the best sessionable craft hoppy can i thought that was coming out of chicago which is a hard thing to get and then you mess with it why i had it on cask i think at jerry's wow that's crazy yeah it was really interesting too it was like tea it was super astringent Mm. okay uh either you guys favorite for you jack i i outside of half acre i love what revolution and pipeworks do and they're frequently in my fridge on on a regular basis those three i think if i've got i guess brand loyalty or or mainstays those three brands i think and vallejo when that's in season as it were for the long season that it's available i love that beer um rev pills i have all the time and you brought some here tonight yeah and uh lizard king from uh yeah. From Pipeworks is just if if you're into mosaic, that's a mosaic pail that's tops. Very as far cool. As bad and, beer. And, and who's making trash? Who's you, who do you just just hate? You're I don't. Like, God, it, this now I gotta think I, of someone I, I, who's, who's making trash. Burned to the ground. Think of who it, is making you know, garbage. It's kind of like pizza. <laughs> Like no, even when it's it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's not. Sometimes it's, it's, it's really. Sometimes not. <laughs> I, I can't. Rem- I honestly cannot remember the last time. You know what? I, the last time I had a beer that I could not stomach uh, was actually I, I poured it out was a Two Brothers beer, and their their juicy pale ale would it would it pinball I think that they've been doing yeah I mm-hmm. I think it was a little old somebody left it at my house but I've I've had it on a couple of occasions and I just don't love it um, I wouldn't call it bad or poorly executed it's just not for me Warrenville is just getting whooped tonight. Yeah. <laughs> And Scottsdale. I will say, I mean, hey, I'll do another one. I will say <laughs> that... So you, you get into it eventually. Well, I'm trying to think, but this one has a, has a happy ending mm. because I think when Baderbrow first came out, they really were just mm. not interesting. You're kind of wondering what the heck they were doing. And the sad thing is I think they kind of made a reputation for themselves with a lot of beer drinkers. I don't know how many people out there have had them in the past, let's say, nine months, I'd go... But their beer has well since changed. they opened their own facility here yeah. in Chicago, and that is one thing that I learned mm-hmm. early on is give a brewery a six month break and try them again and try them again, and then you know eventually if they burn you an- enough times, you, there's no need to try. Mm-hmm. But Baderbrow was one where I was skeptical, drank, I was like, oh, this beer is pretty good, and then I had another, and I was like, oh, that one's pretty good, good too, and then I had. Um, they had a Bach beer called like Red Rooster or something Red like Velvet that. Red Velvet. Red Velvet. Yes. Beer was awesome. Nice. And then they had a smoked wheat beer that was amazing. And I hate wheat uh, smoked. They had a smoked half. It was great. Southside Pills or Southside Pride. Pride yeah. Mm-hmm. Great beer. So I'm, I'm glad to see that people are kind of turning stuff around and 
Yeah, and also I don't want to. I don't Bad is trash an interesting people, term. You know? uh, yeah, no, I, right? I, 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 um, I have to like skip out of the bad because <laughs> <laughs> it's not good for business. No, they, they, they are they, they could be uh, current or potential uh, clients. Mm. <laughs> That's fair. Fair enough. How about you, Andy? Favorites, least um, favorites. I think favorite for me. I mean, obviously, we've talked about a lot of them, but uh, Metropolitan. I think does fantastic yeah. stuff. Yeah, I think their they, tap room open today. Yeah, yeah I'm going. We're hoping to go there tomorrow. But they just, you know, whether it's Crankshaft or I, I, you know, last night ended the night at Fountainhead and they had like a impromptu Oktoberfest celebration. Oh, had afterburner. A half, yeah, had a half solid. half liter of afterburner last night, and it was just a lovely way to end an evening. Uh, that had think, great taste. I think I drank more Metropolitan. Uh, they had Jetstream in a firkin and. Heliostat, and I cannot get enough of Heliostat. I love it when that beer is available. It, yeah, they're, they're Hellas and their Zwickel are like, yeah, I could drink good. that for, for days. <laughs> and then, in terms of defining bad, I mean, bad can be like, are you making poison? And like, where basically it should be Mr. Yuck on the bottle, <laughs> like if, if you get that old reference from Chicagoans. But, uh, uh, or it might be, you know, a place that is just not interesting, like, you know, Two Brothers. But for me, a place that it's not that it's making bad beer, it's a place that uh, I just. I just have determined over the years. I kept trying and kept trying, and I just don't like it. I don't like anything that they do, is Lagunitas. I, I finally realized this last year when I went really? to when I went to the to the brewery here what in Chicago. What a hard brewery to say that to. I, 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 <laughs> I just hey, I feel like I've, I have to work with these people. Hey, I <laughs> just I just I just get in there and I try everything, and it's just it's not that it's it's boring. It's middle of the road, middling. It has a flavor profile that's relatively consistent throughout all of the hoppy definitely, beers. They definitely that's have true. a consistency. And it's just not – and it's a, maybe you call it – and you politely call it a house character. I would call it's it just like a, It's just a deficit. It's just a boring – I mean it's just not, not good. And I just – it's not bad in a sense, but it just – and then I will say I, I was at this new brewery tonight. I was saying um, on tour – and it has fantastic review. Very new, and maybe that's one of the things. But like, very good reviews online uh, on Google, and you know, which is basically the only thing that has any reviews on it. And I had three beers there, and was underwhelmed with every one of them. It wasn't any, wasn't a line. I don't think it was a line issue. I don't think it was a, a, a conception issue. I don't exactly know if it was ex- where it was in execution. It just, I had a pills that was, it just was off. It was slightly off. Uh, I had a lactose stout that was probably fine. It just I maybe just hate the concept. Uh, it's just a su- I don't understand the sweet milk sweet stout. Is, a milk yeah, stout. It, but it's not it's not milk stout. It's like candy sweet oh, like Mexican duper. cakey. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's five percent and it's like it's Whoa. cloying mm-hmm. as all get out. Um, and Caught then, yourself there. Well done. Yeah, I'm trying trying my best. I don't want to hit mm-hmm. the get the button hit on me. But uh, and then I had another one of their uh, and then a pail, and it was just one after another, and it was like, you know, just next, just okay. a couple, and yeah. it's like this is it's not terrible. It just was not anything that I yes. was. It, it's a beautiful space, and I love the fact that new breweries are open. And if, to the extent that they're reasonably young, reasonably new, always go back, always give them a shot because, like you're saying, six months. Mu- I, I almost never go to a brewery in the first six months, even the first year, because it takes so long to figure out what you're doing. Well, here you go. I remember having uh, at one of your favorite bars, uh, Andy, Sheffield's, I remember having Metropolitan and Half Acre when they first opened their first, probably some of their their first batches, I would guarantee, mm-hmm. if not some of their first tap handles. And both of them were middling. Mm. completely middling um you know i remember liking metro a little bit more than half acre half acre was doing an amber like an over ale was and that, a lager yeah. over ale was i remember those cans mm. half acre lager and half acre over ale and you know nothing so you never know. They have to find their identities and 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 stuff like that. So, so if Lagunitas is too is too maybe popular in opinion in that sense, I went to Band of Bohemia last night. Also underwhelmed with that place. It just looks like a. Yeah, I expected you know Michelin star. This this it's all the press that it's gotten. Went in there. The first beer or two aromatically were very pleasing. There was nothing conceptually or 
or in in you know, actually wrong with them, but not impressive. The food was good. The service wasn't great, actually. I was a little underwhelmed with the service. And the place is a weird kind of space for a I've eat I've eaten in a lot of upscale restaurants. Like this was not the service wasn't quite right. The space wasn't quite right. It feels like some sort of it feels like if I was in some small town in Wisconsin and they had opened a brewery in there and it used to be a bank or it used to be like a post office sometimes. It definitely feels and it, like and it, it was something else. And it was else. closed yeah. for like 40 years and they got it for like a buck a square foot and they just had that place and then they just filled it with – they have like these ante rooms and ante chambers that they have no use for. It just – I was underwhelmed with, with that place. Uh, and then – and the another one that I'm not crazy about, and from the beginning, is Five Rabbit. Five Rabbit, when I was at Taste, Great Taste of the Midwest, when it, right after they opened, made two beers back to back that I had at that fast forward. The two worst beers I had in that entire year. They were just poison. They were disgusting. Should not have been served to a human being not fit for consumption. They eventually got their own facility. You know, brought on a well-regarded brewer, you know brewer from Goose, and got better, but. I'm just not into it. I just, I just, I not, don't know that it's ever gotten their, a lot better. There are things. Are they even still around? Are they a thing in this town? I know they occasionally yeah, like end up on some other podcasts and do some Trump yeah. things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they they did that big Trump thing, the Chinga beer. But uh, I like Five Lizard. I like their paletas. I like the, the paletas are, are nice in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, like a wit. It's a three percent wit beer with with various kinds of fruit, guava, and it's, lime. It's it's nothing. And it's nothing like mind blowing, but it's like. But that sounds delicious. What you sounds it's, it's really it's quite refreshing, and yeah, they'll have guava and they'll have watermelon and. Oh, the paletas you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about five lizard. Oh, yeah. yeah, no. The uh, the funny thing is though, like five rabbit has won a medal mm-hmm. uh, at GABF. Five lizard has won a medal. If not two medals um, at GABF, and um, yeah, Palatas is that guava beer is mm. is great because it's so juicy but bone dry, Bo- bone dry, and and like like just over three percent alcohol. It's and so pink, he, yeah, and pink, and it comes in a clear glass. <laughs> pink is pretty cool, yeah, for that. Um, okay, well, the one thing I can guarantee you is that all the rest of the topics suck. <laughs> and that we don't have – let's talk about this. This is a little, you know, pop culture-y, and um, it seems like it's kind of a, a fluffy show. Before the sh- uh, show, Jack was commenting that all the, um, I was the content were, were fluff. Um, a bit of truth, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> um, did you guys see or hear uh, maybe on the link that I put on the outline for you guys to check out uh, the – that show, what is it called? This week with oh, John Oliver. Last week yeah. tonight. Last week Last tonight. Week, yeah. yeah, whatever it's called. So, uh, called out Goose Island as uh, you know, example of um, you know, just just corporate conglomeration, and you know, not not the only mm-hmm. uh, company that he called out by mostly AT and T. Yeah, AT and T <laughs> just really trashed AT and T. But one of the few that he actually spent some time talking about, and I, I don't think it has anything to do with the 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 quality of the beer that that Goose mm-hmm. Island makes. But it it was very much. I think he was lumping them with you know Burt's Bees uh, products, which are owned by Kraft or something now, mm-hmm. or Toms of Maine, who are owned by somebody Colgate. else. Yeah, Colgate. <laughs> and then the next one was you know Goose Island, who's you know, he talked about the commercials where they're up in the hop farms, and they they showed Brett Porter, the uh, you know who the former head head brewer there, and who now uh, works at at ABI and some other role, you know, in the hop farm and and sticking the address his, of the hop farm is like Anheuser Busch Boulevard. Or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, because they own the entire yeah, farm, exactly. which yeah. there isn't surprising, yeah. I guess. You know, um, but my I guess my question is, you know, is this still just something that's um does this show that there is uh does anybody care that's what i always say and then when stuff like this happens i I ask myself again does anybody care yeah you're saying nobody 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 cares even they don't care goose island has become an inauthentic brand i mean it, it just has like for the products that are produced 312 ipa 
to the extent that Honkers Ale is even still produced or whatever else they're doing at the big – at Baldwinsville and Port Collins, wherever they're brewing at at AB. They are products that don't taste like they used to. They're not bad. They're just fine. And if I'm stuck – in a ballpark or a football stadium or a concert venue where AB has bought all the wines. Oh, they don't, they don't do that. Sorry. Uh, if they just happen to have all ABI <laughs> brands on every single bar in the entire place, I'll drink uh, goose IPA and I will have absolutely no problem with that. But, you know, from the tap room, which I famously don't love. And I think it's, you know, generic subway tile to the faux mural outside of the being brewery. A little- yeah, uh, you're giving yourself a little too much credit. Famously, uh, don't, people like I, 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 I talk about don't don't care. <laughs> I, well, I, w- I will show you my mentions after the show. Oh, okay, that, that okay, was not okay. it was not a good uh, it was not a good day. But uh, and it, it, the place it just it's it's an inauthentic brand on the larger level. Uh, so I don't know that. You know, I mean, nobody. I'm not but, even but, here to rail on goose. I mean, no, but the, nobody. The fact that but it my is point goose is, is my point is that nobody. I don't think anybody cares on any real level because if you are in that concert venue and you're not a beer nerd, if you're in that football stadium, you are happy to have a flavorful option. And I don't. I mean, at the end of the day, they can get railed on by John Oliver or whoever wants to make an easy target out of them. But they are still at a base. They're not doing shock top with their ridiculous cartoonish tap handles and that stuff. The beer is still good. It's not. It's not bad in any respect. Conceptually, it's not bad in production. It's maybe not that interesting to beer geeks, but it's I, it's elevating beer. And as I, I should say all this while I'm drinking a Bourbon County barley wine. That is delicious. Yeah. Like they they make fan they make some fantastic beers there. That pills before they ruined it with whatever they did in Baldwinsville. That pills was an amazing beer. That was a that was a great beer. Uh, but I to answer your question, no, I don't think I don't think the we're twelve percent of the market. If that nobody nobody besides ten thousand people in the world somewhere in that neighborhood give a rats about it they just don't care i it, i don't think any of that you can talk about millennials and authenticity and all this stuff i i just don't think anybody really cares um but what, so let me ask you guys then i mean do you guys and and don't just just think about it a little bit has the fact that burt's bees or toms of maine have you noticed it maybe even kind of subliminally or in ancillary ways like oh that's that that's here now oh they have an end cap here Mm -hmm. has it affected your guys perception of them uh in in any way and two has it been has it been negative and do you think it really matters in 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 the grand scheme of of at least their their little lane um i I, yeah you guys no i i haven't noticed (laughs) um but um i i think you know something I mean, maybe there there are a bunch of um, uh, lip balm geeks that are like, oh man, like <laughs> Burt's Bees, like used to be so good before oh, they sold out. <laughs> you're not on lipbalm.advocate.com? dot <laughs> oh, That's a tough but uh, you know, um, I I think that that yeah, there there's a small portion of people that really are are quite um, uh, care a lot about this, and I think that. Mm-hmm. For the most part, most people don't. I mean, the funny thing to me is I have – maybe I'm just a weirdo where I have noticed that and noticed that it's – there's this juxtaposition where I've noticed Burt's Bees. And I just always – like I I don't know if I ever was told, but I always figured out that they had been bought out. Mm-hmm. And same with Toms of Maine mm-hmm. because I just saw like literally the only person I knew who used it was – this hippie girl in high school who I, you know, was in love with. And now I see it kind of all over the place and, you know, Burt's Bees and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you're now, it's now just owned by whoever and it's Mm -hmm. being branded for a feel, but it has no connection to what it actually was. So my feelings are different about those other two brands. And maybe what I'm realizing is, I'm just on an island, and I'm the only person who feels that way about <laughs> I, I don't things know if that's in true. general. I, I I agree. I think part of the issue is uh, the clip. I think was more of an indictment of a lack of enforcement of antitrust laws than mm-hmm. it was anything else. Uh, but uh, I think of things like Ben and Jerry's. Who who owns Ben and Jerry's now? Some uh, big uh, Japanese company, Unilever. Yeah, Unilever. Unilever. Okay, okay. O- owns them. I'm and wrong. so like totally wrong. 
the last year when I went to Fofa, we stayed down the street from Ben and Jerry's and we went on the tour and it was one of the, one of the saddest tours I've been on. Cause it was like a Sunday morning. There were five people and the videos didn't work or whatever, but they take you through like the factory. And it's, it's one of these weird things where they tell you like, and then we sold to Unilever and, yep. and it was this wonderful thing for the company to be able to do when, you know, they have these public people, Ben and Jerry, who are out there, you know, supporting social causes and things like that but at the same time do they i I don't know i I have mixed feelings about it and i don't know if it's necessary that a handful of companies in each industry in in discrete industries own 90 plus percent of the market share or 75 plus percent of the market share to squeeze out competition or or squelch it, right? I, I don't know if that's healthy. No, I, I remember um, uh, this was like the late 80s or something. Beatrice, which owned a bunch of like cereal brands and toilet paper and stuff, mm-hmm. decided like some PR exec was like, oh, no, you need to like let everyone know that this is the company and – and and that you own this and that like rebrand so that like oh they make all these products so th- there were these commercials like we're Beatrice and and I remember the reaction to that was everyone freaked out because it's like wait w- the yeah. single company owns all of these different brands this like thing I identify with <laughs> like right? this thing is like yeah it's, <laughs> this my breakfast cereal like is made by this company that I've never heard of like. And I think it's not, that, a, it's not a Quaker man. No, ex- exactly. <laughs> and and I I think I think um, uh, that that kind of thing uh, can uh, freak people out. I mean, all of these these brands that you think are competing. So I mean, go, going back to like beer. I mean, you go into the bar and it's all of the look. They got all this craft beer, and and then mm-hmm. you go down and it's just like. Oh, it's like you know, Golden Road and and Goose yep. Island and Ten Barrels a place and Wicked like that, Weed that just and, opened by and, me. And it's just and it's it's like oh, whatever I get, my money's going to the same place ultimately. And or do you some really think, Andy, it. that people don't care about that if they knew that all these choices is just an illusion of choice? Really, I mean, to me, or is it an illusion of choice? They are giving you different flavors. I mean, there is Gatorade, mm-hmm. you know. Blue ice and Gatorade <laughs> lemon lime and yeah. Gatorade yeah. midnight purple and you know whatever. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of consumers in the U.S. who clearly care about it, at least when it comes to beer. And those individuals go to places like Corridor and Dovetail and things like that, and they like having that local connection to their brewery. It's also these great communal spaces, which I think is a huge difference than it was ten years ago, before we mm-hmm. really had that micro tap, you know, tap room movement. But when it comes down to it, in terms of people buying beer in stores that are not as uh, beer nerd friendly as yours, like at Costco, where most mm-hmm. most beer in this country is purchased, and mm-hmm. Dominic's and Jewel, and you know, uh, assuming those are even still around in Chicago anymore, or people are buying beer at Walgreens, or they're buying beer at their local package store. That you know, for the most part, they're buying on price. They're buying, you know, they're they're interested in drinking flavorful beer. But most of them are kind of still buying on price. And for them, I don't think they really care about the heritage and all of that. But there are plenty of people in this country. I mean, this show demonstrates it. The fact that there are 6,500 breweries in this country demonstrated that Beer Advocate exists, that Rate Beer is a target for purchase by ABI demonstrates it. Untapped itself just – I mean, that Untapped is Rate Beer and, and, and Beer Advocate for the masses. Like you yeah. see – you'll see – 75 year old guys sitting at a bar checking in like whatever they're yeah, doing and, like, <laughs> and like and 22 year old women and like yep. like families like just like the little kids are like doing a little untapped check-in they're like seven years old two and a half like, bottle caps yes exactly mm-hmm. yeah and they're like this is you know this root beer is just it's substandard uh, and the, but i gotta get a photo of it but yeah i mean it, it and that is sort of the commodification and the gamification of, of beer but like People don't, I think, generally speaking, care about things like that. There are plenty of people who do, but the vast – I mean, when we talk about 12 percent of the market, you, the number of tens of millions of barrels of beer that that actually constitutes – you know, I don't know how many – 6,500 breweries in this country. I don't know how many of them make more than 1,000 barrels. Sure. I mean, I, a quarter – maybe a quarter of those. And so that is a lot of breweries that are just sort of making a tiny amount of beer for a tiny amount of people. You know, like I said, the top 50 make 80 plus percent of the 
if not more than uh, of the beer. So I think that, and then we that doesn't take into account Blue Moon, doesn't take into account Goose and all those products, and and the ones from the big breweries now like Lagunitas and Ballast. I don't think people generally care about that, and I think that's in good. general, not just for yeah. beer, but for in general. So when people go to a store and see a whole bunch of. Um, what were we gonna say? Cereals. Well, they're they're buying yeah. Kashi, and they don't care that it's owned by Kellogg. Yeah. And there's mm-hmm. all these things. They don't care that that Ben and Jerry's is owned by Unilever. Don't know or don't care. Both. I don't. I don't Maybe know. And both, once you yeah. tell them, I don't know that they. I don't know that they really care. And I'm at least for beer. I disagree. I, I hear think it. if you told them that Kashi was bought by Kellogg, and then there was another one that also looked crunchy and healthy, I think people would buy. That one. And if it didn't matter, they would say Kellogg on the front. But they don't say you Kellogg because so they don't want you to know. Small batch cereal. What I'm, I'm yes. saying <laughs> is if they truly didn't care, yeah, there no, would I be agree. the Budweiser yeah. bow tie on every package. And I, my, my point, though, is there's a reason I, it I don't, isn't. I don't care about that sort of thing because I'm – I mean not just as a consumer, but we won. Craft beer won. Flavorful beer won. We just don't recognize that. And I understand that it is still a fight every single day out there for shelf space, for taps. It, it, AB does not play fair. Miller Coors does not necessarily play fair. The Gold Network does not play fair. There are a lot of places that that's in, in ingredients, in packaging, in every single aspect, it is rough like night after night for craft brewers. But they won, and they, they won't recognize that, is that – you know, Anheuser Busch has realized the future is not Bud Light because you know why? They are now. This is, uh, hopefully won't be bleeped out. They're bastardizing Bud Bud Light. They're now it's Bud Light Orange. It's mm. like they're like Bud Light Lime. They're going to do a whole bunch of other things, even though that maybe cannibalizes and kills that brand that was the golden goose for them for so long. But they recognize the days of macro light lager and premium lager are over, and it is now about flavorful beer. What form that takes, that's the future, and that is the debate we're going to have. Uh, and crappers are well positioned to say, look, uh, you know, we are the people who are actually making the beer. We are the connection that you have in that community. This is the space that we invite you into. We are not a massive corporate conglomerate that is basically uh, like just a fund of money that is buying breweries around the world. But and what about is- places that open tap rooms in localities – where they weren't started, like Chicago and Ballast Point. I, I, and, right? that, like, and that's the future. And those guys are going to bring that model in the U.S. And they, Lagunitas tried to do it in Charleston. Didn't work. Like, will that work in Chicago? I can't. Who's going to go to a Ballast? I, just, I can't imagine anyone's going to do that. But you know what? If you put that in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. if you put that in London, uh, you, you put that in, in, you know, in Norway or in Sweden or in Germany – yeah, you're probably going to do okay there. No, the, the Ballast Point thing, they're, they're not even brewing there. I think it's its all going to be kegs produced at their plants. I thought they were, they're not doing uh, any yeah. brewing. I there. think it's there's a small, small pilot yeah, yeah. system or something like that, but like the majority of the beer there is going to oh, be like, sure. from out of state. Um, uh, that said, uh, Jolly Pumpkin's opening up in Hyde Park, and I'm going to be all over that. <laughs> yeah. Why? Ah, uh, the the beer is amazing, um, and I, I've been to a couple of of uh, Jolly Pumpkin uh, uh, pubs, and and it's all they're all different, and they're always good. I mean, the beer is good, the food the is is good, the concept it's not ever sort of I mean, they seem to have that down, whatever they're doing. Um, when when are they opening, and like whereabouts in um, Hyde Park? In I don't know exactly where in Hyde Park. Uh, it's I used to live down there, but it's been years since I've been down. Um, uh, but it's opening in October, I believe. That's great. I mean, I, that sort of thing, I get excited about that. Yeah. Lagunitas, not as much, but like, yeah, you bring that, you bring that there. I'd, I'd go. Interesting. But uh, hmm. uh, final words on that one, Jack. Anything? Nothing. No, I got nothing. <laughs> okay, Chris, you don't have a really long letter to read. I don't. I don't have a, a letter. No? I, for okay. you, I skip the letters. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I should mention that if you do want to contribute to the show, the best way would be via or via a letter. You can send one electronically at insiders at craftbeertemple.com, or you can send one in the mail, U.S. Post Office, 
My four-year-old daughter visited one today. I had to fill out a permission slip. And I was thinking, why does it matter? She doesn't need to learn about these things. They're just they're not going to exist soon, but whatever. Uh, but you can uh, drop one off, and it still will be delivered if you send it to 3219 South Morgan Street. That is the Co-Prosperity Sphere in Bridgeport, Chicago, 60608. And uh, send it to the Beer Temple or to Chris or Ed or Jack O'Connor, anyone. Jack, you've sent letters before. I've, I've sent letters. Yeah. <laughs> Adi never, handwritten. No, Adi never has. Yeah. And, I mean, oh, I'm, Andy I'm, de- does, I'm definitely going to start Andy sending letters. Andy doesn't believe in letters. Yeah. <laughs> he thinks they're, they all, they're all stupid. Mm. Um, start sending letters with the cutout. Um, letters like uh, if you ever want to see your beer again <laughs> I, we, we have had it was it's been a while but we had a type or typewriter letter one time oh wow <laughs> yeah we've had a couple handwritten letters we've that's, had that's uh, not surprising yeah. for this show <laughs> yeah. yeah right thanks <laughs> thanks andy mm-hmm. um let me let me just i mean you do keep coming back on so i just have to i mean come on hey i have a lot to say and not a lot of people want to listen to it so <laughs> yeah. you keep inviting me i'll keep coming cool deal uh, we're, we've come to about the end of our time. Uh, again, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so that's fine. Um, it's always easy when we don't have to go through any of the topics that I had. Um, it <laughs> sorry makes about, it sorry, easier Chris. for me. No, that's fine. I don't mind. That, that's fine for me. It makes, it, makes my job easy. I'll just bring them up again next week. No one will ever know. <laughs> and, we will. Uh, yeah, you will. <laughs> but you probably won't listen. So, uh, I, I want to thank my guests, and uh, I wanted to kind of go around the horn and see if there's any final words or any things that you guys wanted to talk about to close out. Um, Andy, do you want to go first? I'll go. I'll go in reverse. Oh, I usually am the last one because I'm usually here on Skype, so I'm not uh, not entirely prepared. I'm just like I said, I'm on a several day pub crawl through the city here. So if you're a brewer and want me to come stop by, hit me up on Twitter and. Uh, Probably won't come over, but like it, it's nice to get notes from people sometimes. <laughs> I'm basically just going to go back to Dovetail and drink all the lager. But uh, I'm going to try to try to visit some other places. So if you've got some ideas, I'm I'm happy to to, to hear the the places you think uh, are doing good stuff in the city. And you've yeah. got a famous beer friend coming in tonight. I heard. I do, I do. Uh, Papa Bear Jason Alstrom, uh, one of the co-founders of Beer Advocate, is coming in. We're going to drink around the city this weekend. It's been a few years. The first time I actually ever met the Alstrom brothers was a long time ago at Real, Ray Daniels Real Ale Festival that was held at uh, Goose Island uh, on Cla- or Goose Island Wrigley. Yep, at that's that a point. long and, uh, time I mean, ago. It was a long time ago, but uh, so I imagine we're going to tear it up a little bit. So looking forward to it. Fun. And uh, Adi? Oh, yeah. Well, um, like I said earlier, um, I just brewed a collaboration at Corridor with uh, Maplewood. It's Maplewood Omega. Corridor collaboration It is a table saison uh, with new and old world hops. I thought you were going to say New England haze. No, no haze. <laughs> no haze unless um, like something, something really goes. bad happens. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it's... Uh, 20% rice in the grist, so it should be dry and crisp, which I'm looking forward to very much. When's that going to be available? Um, I think that's going to be released in the third week of October. I'm not sure of the actual date, um, but they're going to. it's going to coincide with the uh, uh, Maplewood is going to bring some kegs over to Corridor, and so we're going to have a party there. Fun. Should be fun. Cool. Jack? Uh, I was cruising around the internet a couple days ago, and I noticed that uh, Lumpen Radio has a Patreon page now. That's so, true. I think that that is something that uh, we can ask people to support. I think that uh, it's a worthy cause. Good call. And uh, people should go visit their the uh, Lumpen Patreon page. That's a, a great thing, and I'll here, here. I'll, I'll uh, jump on on that and say that um, if you do like this show, there is no better way to support it than by supporting Lumpen Radio. For those of you out there, um, you know, s- opening hiccups uh, aside, when, when John's producing, you may actually think this is, you know, a pretty professional place, and we've we've come a long way, but for those of you here, uh, and, and certainly people who've Skyped in and then they're here for the first time, like Andy, you realize that, you know, this is very much... Uh, uh, DIY and that. Oh, this is a fire trap, I assume. But yeah, but like <laughs> we're not going to get out alive. But what I've said before, Andy, yeah. on on the radio is you know 
people, you know, on NPR say, you know, if we don't get I, Ira Glass says, if we don't get your money, we'll still be okay. It's not about that, but your your money does help us. It's not really that way here. It's like we we need the money to to survive, and your money will actually help run the station. And there are a lot of shows on uh, with a really a, a group of passionate people who have a whole bunch of topics that they care about, and there's audiences who care about what they're talking about. So it's not just, you know, the beer show. There's all sorts of shows on here with passionate people who will have different types of music, and we've got DJ Rickshaw coming on in a moment to uh, have, you know, put on some some great music, and, you know, it's a, just a great way to, to contribute. So thank you very much, Jack. For that, um, I want to thank everyone out there for listening. I want to thank the chat room. I don't thank them enough. I have all this time. I'm not rushing. I want to thank my guests, Jack, Adi, and Andy, and uh, even producer John. He's been he's he does a very good job. Um, he didn't have any headphones, so I forgive him. So uh, that's about it. We're gonna we're gonna be off two and a half minutes early. It's great. I'm always late getting off. So. That's about all for now. We will see you next week for more of the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Can you hit it on time? There you go. This